Good morning. I think we're going to get started. So it uh, is my pleasure to introduce our uh, grand round speaker this morning, Dr. Kim Williams um, from Rush University Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Williams uh, is the James B. Herrick Professor and Chief of the Division of Cardiology at Rush. Um, Dr. Williams received his undergraduate and medical degrees from University of Chicago. He then went to uh, do his residency uh, at Emory and then went back to University of Chicago uh, to complete his uh, fellowship. Uh, he was on the faculty at University of Chicago for many years, briefly went to Wayne State, and now uh, is uh, the Chief of Cardiology at Rush. Uh, Dr. Williams has had a very storied career as a cardiologist. He's been the president of ASNIC. Uh, he was also the 2015 president of the American College of Cardiology. Uh, and now, uh, interestingly, uh, is very interested and devoted to nutrition. And the fellows who were uh, out to dinner with him last night, I don't know whether you're all vegan now after having dinner with him. Uh, I'm actually scared about eating meat tonight when we have dinner. Uh, but without further ado, I think Dr. Williams is going to talk about something that we really don't learn a lot about around uh, cardiovascular nutrition. Uh, so I'm really excited to hear him speak this morning. Dr. Williams, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yang. And I just uh, I'm gonna grab since I have a public. Uh, forum in front of a lot of people, I can embarrass you by just uh, thanking you for your leadership in the college uh, and all that you're doing for to try to make healthcare better, uh, transform cardiovascular care and improve heart health uh, here in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, yes, I get to talk about uh, cardiovascular mortality and nutrition, and uh, it's a very much a passion of mine. If I advance the slides. That's interesting. Let's see. Got it. Okay. So this is, became my, I always thought that, you know, cardiology was so interesting. Infectious, infectious disease wasn't, but um, I got caught up in uh, really talking about this particular topic. Anybody recognize what this is? Or why I would actually bring it up? Yeah. So um, this is a picture of a really tough time in the United States and around the world. It was the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. And the reason that I talk about it is because it was the last time that heart disease was not the number one killer of Americans. This was an amazing flu. It had a W-shaped uh, uh, mortality curve so that if you were, you know, most flu flus uh, killed babies and the older people. This one, if you, the stronger you were in the middle, you're the prime of life, it would take you out because the inflammatory reaction was so uh, intense. Well, that's really what it took. That was a three-year epidemic. It was uh, really bolstered by the fact that the troops were coming back and forth across the, the ocean. Uh, they call it the Spanish flu, it wasn't Spanish, it's just Spain was neutral in World War I, and therefore their press was saying what was going on, everybody else's press was censured, but you might have noticed 675,000 Americans uh, were dying and the rest of so many people were sick. Anyway, it uh, lasted three years. By the second year, 1919, heart disease was number one again, okay, and it's been number one ever since. And so if you look at the burden of cardiovascular disease in the United States, uh, it's uh, the kind of things that you've all heard. This is why you're here. This is why uh, we uh, work on patients with heart disease. A death every 40 seconds or the, the highlight of that slide uh, or used to be until they published this uh, fifth bullet that I added. If you're taking care of any African-American population, the odds are 50-50 essentially that, the, that they have some form of cardiovascular disease. But let's not be... Uh, uh, U.S. centric because this is a worldwide epidemic now. Um, this was published a few weeks ago at the European Society of Cardiology. The cause of death by country, uh, it turns out that the low income and middle income countries now have uh, heart disease as number one and the high income, uh, high income countries do not, except for one, that's the United States. So um, cardiovascular disease has become more common in the poor countries um, and a lot of it has to do with globalizing American culture, uh, American food, uh, a lot of the um, industrialization so that people are having more screen time and not exercising as much. You can actually pull out what all, and, and pollution, uh, they're really uh, air quality. All of these actually increase uh, cardiovascular mortality. 
And so we have to try, if we're going to globalize how it is that we live that's hurting the heart, well, now we have to globalize the therapies because our therapies have been amazing. So thank you to everyone in this room who's done something on this slide. Um, that is, you know, all hat giving antihypertensives, the stats, the uh, stents, bypass, you name it. We actually had about a 70% decrease in cardiovascular mortality. If you look at that slide, this is uh, Bess Nabel and Jean Gronwald in 2012, really talking about how well we've done in cardiovascular medicine. Uh, the, the problem with it is, I think, characterized pretty truly as mopping up the floor instead of turning off the faucet. All of those were interventions uh, are sort of after the fact. And you could sort of think that after a while, you're going to get to the point that you just can't do much more. And if the population is fighting you with poor nutrition habits, for example, and we can talk about it in detail, that you're going to get to the point, which happened in 2015, that you'd hit a nadir and the cardiovascular mortality starts to go up. Uh, the, other one that, the other one that I take very personally, and I'm always going to mention, is that we still have the uh, black white differences in this, in this country. That is very striking. It's about a 21% increase in cardiovascular events in African Americans. But yeah, the CDC talks about that and they're measuring it vertically. I like to like, measure it horizontally. We're about 11 years behind everyone else. And so we've got a lot of work to do. And the reason I keep talking about the African American population isn't just because they're, if, if you could normalize that, you'd get cardiovascular disease number two if you just took care of that population. But the other side of that is that it's really been. Uh, characterized as an issue of nutrition. So let's talk a, a little bit about these risk factors that we have that are leading to cardiovascular disease. The, the, the growing epidemic of cardiovascular mortality was actually pointed out just a few months ago um, in actually the uh, Wall Street Journal. And of course, they appropriately talk about the heart attacks in younger people, younger and younger, as well as um, and having the cover uh, picture be uh, someone who was African American. Um, and it really has been making a comeback. And if we could just get to these four things, I wouldn't have to give this talk, but it's obesity, diabetes, uh, according to the CDC, but it's also hypertension globally and hyperlipidemia. Uh, the good news is we have the answer, okay? And so hopefully everyone saw in March that we published the uh, uh, ACCHA 2019 primary prevention guidelines. Um, there's a, a cute little graphic that talks about the things that we do to improve risk factors. Uh, and nutrition is down in the little corner, still, still talking about tobacco. Um, and we talked about aspirin. Um, no one mentioned it much more, but just uh, make sure that everyone saw that so-called hashtag, we rethink aspirin. Um, it really is good for people who are at high risk and the low risk people who shouldn't be doing it. But back to obesity, this uh, growing epidemic really is something that we've isolated to be due to the refined grains and the red meat, unhealthy fats, sugar, sugary drinks and not eating enough fruits, vegetables, whole grains. And um, if you, if I had to pick out, I travel a lot and you know, speak at a lot of places and you go to another country that doesn't have the same degree of obesity and you're looking at the food they're eating and it doesn't look as healthy as some of the things you know, that we're eating in the United States, but portion size is completely there. And so the portion sizes have gotten larger it's a marketing issue, and uh, unfortunately, it's uh, really going to have us paying a price in that second uh, uh, quartet here. The 20 to 40 year olds are actually eating fast food uh, almost half the time, uh, every day. This is really a, a major problem. The obesity doesn't strike every population the same. It's much more in women, much more in Hispanic, and of course, African. American, if they added the um, BMI over 25, so overweight and obesity would be over 80% at this point. Um, if you look at all of the things that we've tried to do to change the diet in the American population, you might have seen this published about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, so I stuck, stuck it in because I was just stunned by the fact that we've gotten nowhere. Uh, dietary uh, issues, uh, carbohydrate, fat, and total protein have gone nowhere. Uh, over the, all of this period of time. And you see a little bit of decrease in carbohydrate, a little bit of increase in protein, but not uh, significant. More importantly, <laughs> more importantly, people have to know that all of the data against carbohydrates that I'm going to show you is really talking about low quality refined carbohydrates. And if you're doing that without the fiber, without the way nature made it, um, you're going to get um, a, a, the kind of uh, generation of heart disease that also that 
has been characterized in so many uh, papers, that most of which are actually in this talk. Um, and our impact on low quality carbohydrates has been very small. Um, if you look at uh, animal protein, there's a lot of people, there's a massive number of vegetarian restaurants in Seattle. This is amazing what an what a, uh, opportunity you guys have here. Um, and you look at the consumption of animal protein, it really hasn't changed that much. And so um, if we talk about this in regard to uh, trying to intervene on weight, there is a lot of data and everyone who has a commercial product is out there trying to promote it. And so this is just a handful of them that were done in a prospective randomized trial uh, about 15 years ago. And probably the things to remember are that you don't just want to lose weight, you want to lose it and keep it off for cardiovascular disease. If you, if you go, you go down and go back up, you increase uh, uh, cardiac events that's been shown a long time ago. Uh, and But the curious part about it is that every one of those studies that looks at longevity and duration of weight loss shows that if you're doing completely plant-based nutrition, you tend to get the weight off and it tends to stay off. Why is it? It's actually just simple uh, cardiometabolics or, you know, if you are calories, if you are eating oils a lot, just so that uh, catchphrase that the fat you eat is the fat you wear is actually true because it's so calorie dense. The same thing is fairly true uh, for eating animal products, but uh, vegetables tend to be less calorie dense. You have to sort of focus on them if you don't want to lose weight. Uh, which isn't the easiest thing to do. And so if everyone had that concept, uh, it would make it a lot easier. I'm gonna switch over and talk a about the diabetes and hypertension. And this is uh, from the PURE trial uh, published at ESC about uh, eight weeks ago. And they were talking about all cause death being related to a lot of things, the poverty, uh, uh, but poor diet was uh, barely in the top four. Hypertension uh, was coming in after that. But for cardiovascular disease, that's number one is hypertension. And not everybody, you know, we think of, you know, dyslipidemia, we're managing it all the time, but we really need to focus on the blood pressures as well. How about hypertension and nutrition? We've actually got some good data, uh, not too far from here. Uh, if you go south to Loma Linda, you find the uh, Adventist Health Studies 1 and 2, where they have uh, actual, um, not randomized, and, and they're self-selected. But they tell people to, to be lacto ovo vegetarian in that, uh, from, in that congregation of Adventists. Um, and people vary and they actually agree to be followed. And so you get a massive amount of data. And it's interesting that if you're, if you're only concerned about overweight obesity, there's only one group um, that is not overweight. And that's the people who do completely plant-based plant nutrition. And consequently, the incidence of diabetes, uh, hypertension, would be almost half of what you would get uh, in, in the lacto ovo population, and that one is so, so much better um, than um, being less um, restrictive. Of course, we want to know, does that translate to mortality? And the answer is, yeah, it's about a 30% decrease. Obviously, um, people are going to die of something, but if you look at ischemic heart disease, you are actually going to decrease it substantially the more vegetarian you are. They've actually characterized that pretty well. This is a question, sort of the answer to the question I get all the time um, in their, one of their more recent publications. Number one, if I do this diet, am I going to live longer? Or is it just going to seem like it? That's, that's, that's one of those uh, Dean Ornicisms. Um, uh, and it turns out that uh, they do have an answer to that. You are going to live longer if you do completely plant-based nutrition. If you decide to do a little less of it, um, out of that 10 years that you're going to gain as a man, you're going to get, you know, if you do 80% of the plant-based diet, you're going to get 80% of that uh, improvement. Um, but more importantly, it's about being 30 pounds lighter. What does that mean for joint, joint replacements and spine disease and being able to go up and down in the mountains and enjoy your life? So the vegan vegetarians are actually doing so much more uh, activity during their lives um, and less diseases. And you, the, um, if, you, if you're going to have to, if you, people should be able to look at this data and choose how much intermediate protection uh, they would like to have. Um, and people really can't control the outcome. If you look uh, more globally at blood pressure, uh, there is a lot of data, prospective, randomized data. Uh, the majority of it, there's some heterogeneity here, but uh, most of the data would indicate that the more plant-based you are, the more plant uh, you're doing uh, on a, on a full-time basis, the lower your blood pressure is going to be. Uh, that did make it into our guidelines for hypertension management. Uh, we were roundly considered for, uh, or, or uh, criticized for lowering the, the target blood pressure to 130 over 80. Um, and uh, hopefully everyone heard the messages and the sprint trial and 
other things that led to our committee doing that. Um, they said that we were in the pocket of pharmaceutical industry, but the fact of the matter is that meant they didn't read the documents. We were talking about non-pharmacological therapy, and that includes the physical activity of varieties, and all of these are actually additive in terms of blood pressure reduction, uh, cutting back on the alcohol, which nobody wants to hear, uh, the weight loss, which people really don't want to hear, um, but doing some simple things like focusing on potassium uh, increase, preferably through food, and uh, decreasing dietary sodium uh, to less than 1,500 milligrams a day. Those can have a big impact on blood pressure. And then in, in green and bold, of course, is that if you do a dietary intervention that has more fruits and vegetables, whole grain and the like, like the DAS trial, uh, will, you will decrease blood pressure substantially. And the lower your cholesterol, lower in fat, which means the more vegetarian you are, the lower the blood pressure. Okay. Now to switch over to talk about sugar and sweeteners. Um, sorry for everyone who didn't see the slide before you put the sugar in your coffee this morning. Okay. Um, just remember that when you're doing that, you're getting an insulin uh, buzz. And that insulin increase, it turns out, is resulted, uh, resulting in dyslipidemia, hypertension, and hyperinsulinemia, more central obesity, and more atherosclerotic plaque. And that is the, the underpinning of this JAMA article that clearly show that the more sugar you eat, you have this curvilinear increase in mortality. Now, we actually had this data for a while because the Nurses Health Study has been talking about this for, uh, this, I think this one is 2010, um, when they first started talking about it, this is the Harvard group uh, asking nurses to um, be followed and find out what they die of. And this looks like it's a complicated slide. If you're not, so many of you are sitting in the back, you won't see it, so, so I'll um, uh, sort of summarize it for you. I thought, of course, that it was going to be smoking given the third year longevity and people were still smoking a lot. Smoking came in third. Number one was aging. Should have thought of that. And number, <laughs> no, no. number two was actually diabetes, uh, believe it or not. But uh, buried in the upper right-hand corner, they talk about nutrition. <clears throat> and it turns out that eating vegetable fiber, and they um, did it based on uh, cereal fiber. Excuse me. Breathing. No, just um, as it turns out, uh, that improves mortality. So hazard ratio drops about 16%. Which is exactly the opposite would be uh, instead of doing vegetable fiber, doing a cholesterol load like a big hamburger, and that would increase your um, uh, mortality by about 17%. But sure enough, that the um, uh, point estimate for doing a glycemic load, that is instead of doing the hamburger, doing the Dunkin' Donut, actually was worse. And so it didn't reach statistical significance against each other, but I think that was the first signal that we really shouldn't be uh, replacing uh, a meat diet with a sugar diet. We have more data on uh, beverages than we had. This is all coming out in the last couple of years, you know, all saying that sugar sweetened and even artificially sweetened beverages uh, increase mortality. Um, the, there are several analyses like this. I'm just giving you the most recent one from uh, Nurses Health. Uh, that 31% increase in mortality if you're, if you're doing sugar sweetened beverages. Um, and if you're doing the artificially sweetened ones, it's only about a 13% increase in mortality. So not exactly the same, but they are both uh, increasing diabetes and plaque. And so if I were to try to summarize it, we have clear indications of summarizing a lot of literature that there's a unique association between uh, refined carbohydrates of all varieties and diabetes, uh, even artificially sweetened beverages because most of them actually do raise insulin levels. And if we were to back off of that and even substituting polyunsaturated fat for sugar, you actually would do uh, particularly well. And there's this unique relationship that has nothing to do with calories, apparently, uh, between red meat and, um, and the development of diabetes. Now, if you look at um, the data on, on intervening on diabetes, it's actually very clear that the more plant-based you are, the, the better off you're going to be. Um, and so this is a meta-analysis by uh, published in JAMA not too long ago, uh, clearly indicating that if you were going to make a big difference in, in a person's diet, you do it with a plant-based uh, uh, approach, you're actually going to lower their A1C. Um, the development of diabetes is actually um, a very, I was talking a few slides ahead, uh, but um, the development of diabetes is actually related to how much plants you're eating, um, that is, the risk goes down, as you see in the slide, the more plant-based you are, the lower your risk of diabetes. So this is actually the uh, Neil Barnard's group doing, a, doing a, summarizing the interventions. And it's actually very clear 
that you can, uh, particularly uh, over the longer term, you can make an intervention, um, make a person plant-based. Uh, what you're really doing is decreasing the amount of refined carbs and, uh, and, and the red meat, and those two together actually lead to much better diabetes control. Okay, so that is something that it was not a surprise based on the basic physiology. What I was surprised was this BMJ article um, talking about the same sort of thing, but looking at a, a, a wider variety of things than we normally do. The summary is this. It isn't just your hemoglobin A1C when you put someone on a plant-based diet and you're diabetic. Um, it's and the cholesterol and their weight, but physical well-being, depression, quality of life. And so the answer to that Dean Orange question, you know, am I gonna live longer? It's just gonna seem like it is. Yeah, you're actually gonna feel a whole lot better about everything. Okay. I'm going to talk about diet and mortality because there's we've got some unique data sets um, uh, in the United States. This is uh, data from the REGARDS trial. The REGARDS uh, people were looking at re regional variation in stroke and um, looking at it by nutrition. And these Kaplan-Meier plots are uh, plots are not pretty, uh, but the worst is the so-called Southern diet. That actually is the typical African American diet that we have ex exported to the rest of the population. And so um, and it's taking your greens and putting you know, fat back or something like that in it, taking a yam and making it candy yams, uh, a lot of sweet tea, a, a lot of organ meats, and you put all that together and it increases stroke. It increases uh, microinfarction, infarction, increases uh, mortality overall, particularly after development of kidney disease. And so uh, being able to move along that curve in a different direction would, would be uh, really great. And so I'm really happy that they're actually pointing it out. Um, they were really, really concerned about the stroke belt and they found out basically it's nutrition. Uh, JAMA a couple of years ago did a wonderful job of telling us what we really shouldn't be eating in this country. And this is an article that looks at mortality. It is an, another way of looking at the nurses health and health physician um, follow-up or health uh, professional follow-up study, which is mostly for physicians. And um, it gives you cut points, which I find extremely helpful. Uh, it says that if you were doing more than 2,000 milligrams of sodium, that increases your mortality. Not enough nuts and seeds. Um, I'm not sure I could agree with this characterization, so, uh, you, uh, saying that anything that greater than zero grams per day uh, of processed meat actually increases mortality. I don't suppose that would be high. It sounds like any ever, um, but uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the omega-3s in a bit. Uh, that's a, a very in interesting topic of what I believe is uh, substitutionary benefit. Not eating enough vegetables, not eating enough fruit, um, and then another one of those high things, sugar-sweetened beverages, and the definition of high is any ever, so uh, greater than zero. Uh, not enough whole grains, and everyone should be um, removing the saturated fat from the diet um, and not eating very much red meat. And that is how we avoid dying from, from our nutrition. But I have to have a special call out to, because there are a lot of people, um, as I roam the, the vegan uh, uh, populations of this planet, it's not mostly about hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. A lot of it's about animal rights. A lot of it's about uh, environmental stuff. I, all of those are uh, laudable goals. Um, but it has led to the development of a lot of fairly unhealthy vegan foods. And so um, I won't call anybody out by name unless you ask during the discussion. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, if you, there, this was published in JACC a couple years ago. Very uh, a, a good characterization of what an uh, unhealthy plant based diet would be refined grains, like you know, taking a potato and frying it, french fries, uh, a lot of sweetened beverages, uh, um, and uh, a lot of sodium. If you put it in, you know, we used to say if it doesn't have a face and doesn't have a mother, it's okay. Totally not true. It really should be a whole food plant-based diet. If it's not, it actually increases mortality. So the shock was this one, the right curve, showing coronary uh, heart disease incidence. And the animal-laden diet, the standard American diet is red, and the dotted line is actually an unhealthy plant-based diet. And so um, those uh, vegan cupcakes that you all love, <laughs> so, um, probably not the best thing to do. Um, every once in a while in this talk, I'm going to go global, and this is another one because it was so jarring to see this published a couple of months ago um, in, in Lancet, where they characterized the global burden of heart disease and said that if we were to fix the diet, 
we could save in 2017, we could have saved 11 million lives. But you know, 11 million lives is one thing, but 255 million disability adjusted life years, people whose lives are ruined because their father had a stroke and now they have to take off work. And this is, this is really a major issue. Um, and so getting this word out globally is really important. Let's talk about uh, fats. It's a, uh, a very controversial area, mostly because uh, there are people who really don't like the message of having low fat diet or substituting saturated fat. When you say substituting saturated fat, you're basically saying get rid of the animal products and uh, there are a lot of industries that don't like that. Uh, this led to um, uh, you know, Time Magazine and uh, a book by um, uh, Nina Tykos, The Big Fat Surprise, saying that we're all wrong about this and that people are not getting fat because they're eating fat. And so um, the AHA took this on uh, a, a couple years ago and said, we're gonna just summarize all the world's literature. You're having this argument with somebody, you know, this is a good article because it has pretty much every, every piece of literature that was published up until then. Um, and their bottom line was just what you thought. That is, if you replace the saturated fat with unsaturated fat, you're going to improve lipids and uh, atherosclerosis and improve outcomes. Um, the articles that really um, inform us on this, it's very clear that the more saturated fat you're eating, the worse, um, the worse you're going to do in terms of lipids, uh, plaque formation, and mortality. Trans fats are worse than saturated fats, and I don't have to spend too much time in this country talking about that anymore, uh, since it's illegal to serve it now. Uh, but monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fats actually lower mortality. And so every time you make it just a tiny substitution of um, saturated fat with monounsaturated fat, you actually decrease mortality. I will mention the trans fats in case you go to another country, because there are only four on the planet right now, developed countries, the United States, Denmark, Sweden, and Canada, that actually ban trans fats uh, in public uh, uh, restaurants and food services. Um, they are very dyslipidemic, they are diabetogenic and associated with heart attack and stroke, and um, we've gotten wonderful data on that. Uh, and in intervening, it started in New York, intervening uh, in certain counties and seeing the stroke and heart attack rates drop. Talking about cholesterol and inflammation, um, there's a, a lot of confusion about that. People will tell you that uh, eating cholesterol doesn't change your cholesterol. Uh, that is true if you're eating massive amounts. Um, but just for the record, uh, if you're eating animal products, with very few exceptions, you are getting cholesterol. And um, most of them are a fair amount. Fish is a little bit better than um, a beef and pork and chicken. Uh, and the vegetable products do not have um, significant amounts of uh, cholesterol. And um, egg whites don't have cholesterol. The problem with egg whites in this country is that most people are eating them with egg yolks. And so it's a really massive amount of cholesterol that, that people are getting. Can you intervene and make a difference in, by changing the cholesterol content of the diet? Absolutely. This was shown um, uh, the month I went vegan in March of 2003. So it's all over doing this uh, portfolio diet. It's got a bunch of plant sterols and you know, black bean soup and veggie burgers and uh, viscous fibers and, uh, and almonds. And they actually did uh, an intervention and compared a, a sort of American Heart Association diet versus at that same diet plus lovastatin versus uh, the totally vegan portfolio diet with all of those uh, features. And they both showed a significant decrease, it's almost immediate, over a two week period in LDL cholesterol uh, that, that persists. And, but the other surprising thing is uh, the C-reactive protein response showing that the plant-based diet is actually anti-inflammatory or that the animal laden diet is pro-inflammatory. Um, that actually was uh, also published uh, just a few months ago. Um, it's interesting that the AHA chose to publish uh, an anti-AHA diet um, paper. Um, Anita Shaw put this data together, um, actually doing a prospective vegan intervention and seeing a significant drop in high sensitivity C-reactive protein um, with that, uh, and, but, and getting people to uh, change from a regular diet to an AHA diet did change the, the CRP, but only very, very slightly. But go back to talk about lipids. Got to show you another one of those meta-analyses. This is another one by Neil Barnard's group looking at um, the, a massive amount of data saying that everyone who says that you, you're, if you change your cholesterol content of your diet, it's not going to make a difference. How do they do that? You know, uh, First of all, most of those studies are funded by the egg board uh, or other people who have a vested interest in people eating cholesterol. 
And it's actually pretty sim simple to overwhelm the Neiman pick enzyme in your GI tract. So you take a person who's eating a standard American breakfast, two, two slices of bacon, two eggs, and then you add three more eggs and you won't see much of a change in cholesterol. But if you go from two to one, you'll see a difference. And if you go from one to zero, you'll see a difference. You'll see a, a negative difference. And so dietary interventions can improve uh, lipids, no question about that. Now, this uh, talking particularly about eggs because of the massive amount of cholesterol that's in it and the fact that uh, the incredible edible, I wish the egg board worked for me. They're actually so good at, uh, at marketing. Uh, but the data was uh, very clear from you know, every uh, systematic review, every um, prospective trial that, that looked at outcomes shows that if you do them for a long time, you increase mortality. And so uh, this was published in February in, in JAMA. I do like to call JAMA my uh, vegan propaganda journal, but of course it isn't. It, uh, these are really good uh, editors and, and reviewers. And the data is very, very clear that there's this linear relationship between egg consumption and mortality. And how low do you have to go to avoid that mortality? It's about a half an egg uh, per day. Um, but a couple other points. One is uh, every 300 milligrams, that each egg yolk is about 250 milligrams, unless it's a large one, then it could be 300. That's about a 17% increase in mortality. Um, and the, the message that a lot of the vegan people did not like at all was bullet point number three. That is that if you adjust the model for the cholesterol content, eggs don't actually increase your mortality at all. So that's sort of giving a pass to egg whites. Um, so we'll, we'll see. I, that didn't make me start eating them again because I require two trials before I can change my diet. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. So, um, so let's talk about the ketogenic diet. This is really spreading. It's really vexing uh, to have people uh, taking um, a concept. It's been around for a while. Uh, look at Atkins and look at the result of Atkins and the and the fact that so many people are now taking this and you know South Beach is a little less red meat but it's uh, really more of the same. Uh, the carnivore diet, the paleo diet, um, uh, these really are variations of the same thing. Low carb, high protein, and in most cases high fat. Um, and there's actually been data, this is now 12 years ago, the first time one of these was published, this is from Greece, showing that people were doing that, yes you're able to lose weight, but it increases mortality by about 22%. Um, a Japanese analysis of their own data and a meta-analysis uh, came to a very similar conclusion, except it wasn't 22%, it was about a 31% increase in mortality. Then along came, uh, and these are great Twitter fights, if anybody but, uh, follows me on Twitter, you've seen them going back and forth. Um, when the Seidelman article came out, of course I uh, tweeted it out uh, because uh, it's the way to get this message to a lot of people. And this is Lancet Public Health that is not uh, some you know, a journal that's not uh, supplied by Night Journal. This is uh, real data. And what they found is that um, it doesn't matter which side of the carbohydrate um, uh, spectrum you're on, if you're doing anything that's too high or too low, that it increases mortality. Of course, the high, the high carbohydrate diets, as the PURE trial has, has mentioned to us, they're talking about refined carbohydrates. So going back 30 slides ago, but if you're doing the low carb diet, and you're doing things with animals, you're increasing mortality significantly. And if you're doing it with plants, it actually lowers mortality by about 18%, interestingly enough. Um, how much you do determines how much you die, uh, believe it or not. And uh, hopefully people, everyone uh, would see this. There was a lot of backlash about this and how food frequency questionnaires are no good and uh, saying things that the data is too noisy and everyone who's ever taken a statistics class knows that if the data is noisy, you get less statistical significance, not more. So these p-values are actually highly significant. It dovetails very well with previously published uh, uh, literature and uh, what they're saying about a 20% increase in mortality. In a cardiology on audience, I want to show you one more about the low carb approach. And that uh, is from Jaha a couple of, a few years ago, where they looked at um, myocardial infarction survivors. Uh, and if you do that with uh, prior myocardial infarction, the increase in mortality uh, was 30%, but the, for all costs, but cardiovascular mortality increased by 53%. So really no one with any kind of heart disease should be doing that kind of diet. A couple more things that were published in the last two weeks. Um, 
there's a people are talking about doing the ketogenic diet because it improves diabetes. And if you decrease your central obesity, you are going to increase. You're going to improve your diabetes, no question about that. Um, but uh, at what price? So your glucose and lipids, you look at them carefully. Glucose, lipids, and inflammation. And what you find out is that uh, the diabetes gets better, but the cholesterol and the inflammatory markers actually get worse. And you could look at adiponectin and see reactive protein, IL-6. You could look at LDL, cholesterol. All of them actually significantly get worse. So the data was actually put together by the um, National Lipid Association very recently. Uh, Carol Kirkpatrick actually uh, summarized all the data. And I, I was stunned by this because I actually debated Carol at the NLA uh, meeting a year and a half ago. And she was the keto person. I was the vegan person. And uh, she's kind of switched based on the data. So this was a review of all the evidence uh, by someone who was very much pro-keto and uh, came to the conclusion that um, you actually do have an improvement of weight, but all of the, uh, the rest of the metabolic factors are not good. And so um, good to see that she actually made that, that intervention. So what's wrong with the keto giant? Yeah, it's the fact that it has red meat in it. And we've had this data for a long time. I've always showed this. Uh, red meat kills and processed red meat kills faster. Uh, that is actually dose related. The biggest increase in the mortality is between zero and one. So I'm not sure that moderation actually works. Um, that any kind of thing you do to substitute for red meat actually improves mortality. And that, you know, we're always talking about heart attack, stroke, and death. We ought to be talking about heart failure as well, because we do have data now that says that there's a unique relationship between uh, the development of heart failure uh, and red meat consumption. And heart failure mortality as well. Okay, so how about fish? Everybody likes it. We're in the Pacific Northwest. We have to deal with the fish data. All right. And so, first of all, um, there is good data to say that fish is so much better. And so you saw some of it saying low, low omega 3s. That's because, to say, if someone is going to force you to take uh, either arsenic or cyanide, take the arsenic. Right? Okay. And so, all right. Um, but there has been data, um, again, this is a health professional follow-up study uh, and nurses' health, saying that there are no safe animal products for human consumption. If you have any cardiovascular risk, this was, a lot of this was taken out by the vegan population to say nobody should ever eat any animals. Um, that's actually not what the article says. It's the people who are athletes. And, uh, and then, if you have any risk factors, uh, then you should not be eating any animal products. So the data was actually a little surprising. Um, the, the big surprises here are on the cancer, um, where even though processed meat is a World Health Organization group one carcinogen, that egg consumption was more associated with, um, with uh, uh, more cancer mortality than even processed meat. Well, at least the point estimate was. If you blow up and take a look at cardiovascular disease, there again, there are no safe ones the, um, for obvious reasons for those uh, statisticians in the group, uh, that 12% increase in mortality with fish and dairy is very similar to the egg increase in mortality, but the eggs didn't reach statistical significance. Why? So many of them died of cancer and dead people don't have heart attacks. And so, yeah, and so, but processed meat came out as, as a, a real generator of cardiovascular mortality. Put all of the data together and it was very clear um, that they, there is a hierarchy uh, if people are absolutely going to eat an animal product, it should be poultry, fish, uh, and dairy, certainly not red meat, not eggs, and not processed red meat. Okay. This was a surprise uh, about two weeks ago. Same journal, same title. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a, I am a journal editor. I wouldn't have had the guts to do that. <laughs> but um, interestingly enough, this is completely not American. This is actually the Japanese data set, the uh, uh, Japanese public health study. And it almost was identical with a few differences. Probably the biggest difference to point out is that the cardiovascular mortality data, something different about the United States versus Japan, is that processed red meat uh, was a stronger correlate with cardiovascular death than it was in the United States. And red meat was the same. So don't eat the steak in Japan. That's what it is. I'm not sure how that happens because you know everything about processed meat should make it uh, substantially worse, um, but apparently not. Okay, getting back to the, the prospective fish diet, and that would be changing from the control uh, diet uh, in the Mediterranean area to one that specifically uh, tries to get rid of red meat, uh, do more fish, uh, more, more poultry, 
and then supplementing with extra virgin olive oil or nuts. That was Predimed. You're all familiar with it, more familiar with it last year because it got um, retracted. Uh, because you know, if I if, you know, if I was in the same household, my brother got uh, randomized uh, last year, and then I joined the study. I don't get randomized. They send me the same thing that he got. So that was retrospectively uh, five years later republished as a retraction and a reanalysis. I didn't change the slides because they're basically the same. Um, the N is a little smaller in 2018, and the 30% reduction as a hazard ratio of 0.7 is now 0.6, I was 0.71, so not substantial. The message is the same. That is, if you do this, um, this intervention, mostly getting rid of more red meat and supplementing with nuts and olive oil, you will decrease heart attack, stroke, and death by about 30%. And then there's the surprise that seems to be ignored by everybody. If you looked at mortality, it wasn't any different. And if you looked at heart attacks, it wasn't different. And so the neurologist should be happy with this because you know their workload would go down if everybody did that. But the rest of us, you know, I'm sorry, your husband died, but at least he didn't have a stroke. That's not what we're looking for. And so I, um, so eating the fish did not save anyone. Um, extra virgin olive oil uh, seemed to do a little bit better than the nuts, but it didn't reach statistical significance. So anyway, Emilio Ross is one of our American College of Cardiology and Nutrition people. Um, we, most of us are vegans on it, and you know, there's a paleo person. We've got representation from everywhere. Um, but we hassle them, if they're not a vegan, we hassled mercilessly. So with uh, Emilio, it's like, why didn't you guys do a vegan intervention? And, and he said, you know, well, we kind of did. That is, it was prospective. It was not randomized to vegan diet, but we collected the information, and they published it. And it's really striking. So a study that showed no mortality benefit Watch this, if you take the people and ask them how much vegetables are you eating, how vegetarian is your diet? Uh, if you're doing a, veg a vegetarian diet, it was a massive improvement in mortality. So the top two quintiles saying that maybe you don't have to do that, absolutely, um, but the fifth quintile is essentially vegans, and that was a 42% reduction in mortality. So a plant-based Mediterranean diet uh, was to be very strong. Okay, I'm um, going to talk about protein for a moment. Um, this is something that everyone sort of laughs at. We hear it all the time. You know, the dietitians telling people that you cannot get enough protein doing a vegan diet, you know, and nobody's downing the tofu piece. Um, the interesting part about that is that the dietitians actually know, they all know better if you ask them, you know, well, where should I get the protein? Well, state. Well, that comes from a cow. What does a cow eat? Uh, and then they realized that the largest land mammals on the planet are all vegetarians and none of them are protein deficient, you know, they're running races and winning the triple crown and have never eaten any animal products. And humans are actually very, very similar in terms of physiology. Um, so the other thing that's, it, that's actually does show up on this slide is that people are shocked at is that beef and peanuts are the same amount of protein, that quinoa is more than egg whites. Uh, and the dietitians, when you, when you tell them, oh, can you help my patient with gout? The first thing they tell them is to don't eat the beans. Why? Because it's a massive amount of protein. So the idea that you can't get protein from vegetables, actually, you probably, you probably need to modulate it a little bit. Soybeans and lentils are massive amounts of protein. Okay, so what's really wrong with eating the protein from animals? If, um, I mean, I, I know I've thrown so much data at you, but if I could emphasize one thing, it would be this. This is Cleveland Clinic talking about trimethylamine in oxide. It's a, something that everybody should know. If you haven't seen it, it's worth just Googling it. And, uh, and taking a look at the data. Yeah, if you do it before lunch, because you'll be vegan by lunch. Okay. All right. So this is New England Journal of Medicine. You take animal products, it's got phosphatidylcholine, choline, beta um, and, um, and creatine. You put them in your GI tract, and the meat eaters actually have a bad microbiome compared to vegetarians and vegans. And that microbiome produces from those uh, components, from animal uh, pro protein breakdown, trimethylamine, which then gets oxidized by your liver. Yeah. Trimethylamine in oxide is uniquely associated with plaque development, plaque instability, uh, plaque rupture, and then platelet aggregation. That's a bad combination for heart attack, stroke, and death. And so you can see these quartiles, the higher you have it, the more events you have. The lower you have it, the lower you do. And sure enough, uh, the platelet aggregation studies, this looks kind of complicated, but on the right, you're basically looking at the effect of aspirin. So if you're, um, you'd be better off doing a, having a low TMAO level and not taking aspirin uh, compared to someone with a high TMAO level uh, taking aspirin. Yet the, um, uh, 
inflated aggregationists about the same. That all makes perfect sense until they publish this in Jack, and it's like it floors you. Um, if you have heart failure and you have a high TMAO level, it increases your mortality dramatically. And so, or at least it's associated with increased mortality. So, this whole idea that heart failure is uh, related to eating red meat and red meat, therefore, associated with TMAO, maybe it's a mechanism because of all the bad things that that chemical does. Um, but we all, it, it leads to the idea, which Kyla Lara, who's now at um, Mayo, uh, thought of, which is how about doing a vegan intervention? Um, and or it's looking at vegan data sets. And so they did a small intervention, but they also went back, and this was published a couple months ago, looking specifically at the dietary patterns in the REGARDS trial. Remember that from 30 slides ago? And if you were doing a plant-based diet, there's a 41% lower risk of heart failure. And so um, the, the, the plant-based diets, lowering risk of heart failure, the Southern diet dramatically increasing the risk of heart failure. Um, there has been data published specifically on the trimethylamine in oxide and prognosis in heart failure. And so this is why you can, you can use that uh, uh, intervention very easily. Uh, go plant-based, your TMAO level will fall. Okay, so, um, it's not just TMAO. Uh, Alicia Wilk actually analyzed all of the data, you know, 450 articles and published in 2015, saying that people shouldn't eat red meat. It's about the diabetes, the different kinds of stroke, not just stroke, coronary heart disease, heart failure. Um, and she put together this complicated slide that nobody can quite read. So you might uh, get the slides, by the way, will be on the desktop, they're available, because uh, I know you can't see everything on here. And I don't think she intended people to see it. I think she intended people to be overwhelmed by the fact that there's so many things about eating uh, red meat and processed meat. Uh, the TMAO stuff is on the left. Um, the one that caught my eye because I had seen it in the NIH study is in the middle is heme iron. Um, and heme iron, as well as nitrates and nitrites, has been called out by the National Institute of Health WRP study saying that that's what increases mortality uh, substantially. So it's worth mentioning heme iron. Everybody knows you're supposed to get iron, but you really should be getting it from plants, not animals. And if you're getting it from, from animals, it's oxidized iron. And it puts some oxidative stress on people, increases inflammation, instability of plaque, and, and ischemic effects. So at this point, if, if red meat is so bad for you, how could the annals on September 30th come out with this idea uh, that they were going to publish a guideline, so to speak? <coughs> and this is one of the most interesting controversies in the whole vegan community, our nutrition committee, uh, the our ACCHA guidelines that say minimize or avoid, uh, and all of a sudden we have these people writing guidelines in annals, uh, which you know we like to think that we're big and bad in cardiology. But primary care sees much more of our uh, dyslipidemia, hypertension, shortness of breath, chest pain. Primary care, and they're reading this journal. And so uh, we were all uh, fit to be tied, of course. And um, having been in advocacy issues for a long time, I realized there's always a flip side. And I said, you know, uh, this calm down, it's going to be okay, because all it's going to do is highlight how important the data is, and that data says people should not be eating red meat. And so people were not comforted by my words, but it turns out that that's pretty much what happened. Okay, so let's look at what they're saying. Uh, what this whole controversy, if you hadn't seen it, it was uh, and hitting the news saying people should continue eating red meat. Um, if you look at all-cause mortality and cardiometabolic out outcomes, if you look at cancer mortality and incidence, the third one was cardiometabolic and, and cancer outcomes and with meat consumption. And, and then the fourth one was actually not uh, analyzing uh, data retrospectively, which the first three were. It was asking people, what do you think about the hamburger you're eating? And they all liked it. Okay, that turns into a paper in annals, gosh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the first three, the kind of conclusions were very clear each time that if you take a very narrow window, okay, that is relatively short term, some of the data was 28 years, most of it was about 10 years okay, of data. I mean, if you take that narrow window and you change the diet, this is what they were trying to estimate from the data, from seven servings down to three, not getting rid of them, but just a modest reduction, and every one of them showed that there was a small decrease in risk but they say low quality of evidence. So if all of them were very consistent showing that there's risk with a small change, you would assume that if you, you know, adjust or, or uh, take it linearly, that making a larger change would be a larger uh, improvement. 
Um, it, it's, but even with the data as published, it was very hard to see why they came up with recommendations uh, by Bradley Johnson and his Nutrirex people, uh, who actually said that, yeah, since it's a small amount of data, it's, all, it's not very high, uh, what people should do is keep eating what they've been eating. And that uh, panel was self-appointed, and the only shock is that it actually got into, into the annals. And so, you know, people are calling for investigations because not too long afterwards, uh, this is what happened. He actually was getting paid by the meat industry. And so it's very unfortunate that ended up in annals. They, they, they're good people, they, they've tried to do the right thing, and they got caught up with people lying on their uh, disclosures. Um, so very, very sad, um, but, it, uh, but it did exactly what I said it would do. The responses were un, uh, unbelievable. So True Health Initiative, plant, uh, the Plantrition Projects, uh, health experts all over, Amer the uh, uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, uh, AMA, American Cancer Society, everyone coming out saying that this is wrong. And I think it really did draw attention. And if, if, if Bradley Johnson was trying to increase meat consumption, I think he probably failed because uh, the, the backlash was so strong and it's so loud and vociferous. Okay, so my take on it was this, that these are not American. This is totally un-American. We're eating about 200 pounds of red meat per year. If you take that, that is not going from seven to three. That's like if you average that out and say a pork chop is four ounces, you take that 200 pounds, you divide, do the math, it's about 15 per week. So it really wasn't applying to us at all. Um, and so, and the other thing, the whole, you know, looking at studies and drawing conclusions off of 10 years of data, I want my patients to live longer than 10 years. Okay. All right. Um, before concluding, I have to address one other issue that um, is, has been there in cardiology, but missing a little bit. And that is the whole idea of treating patients, doing revascularizations, and never telling the patient how to get the plaque to go, go away so that they don't end up with it again. Turning plaque uh, progression into regression, this isn't new. This is Blankenhorn and, and um, Greg Brown, and they did this back uh, in 1990. It was kind of like, by any means necessary, get that cholesterol down. It was, you know, well called, and a lot of things that people didn't feel good about, a little bit of statin back then. Um, but they showed that with a lot of scatter, you can get disease to start to go away if you get the LDL cholesterol down. Now, if you look at Steve Nissen's data 14 years later, done with intravascular ultrasound, it was very clear that um, you could get plaque regression to go away if you use the highest dose of statin. And they, they were saying, you know, ultra high dose, that's uh, rosuvastatin 40, atorvastatin 80. The lower doses didn't do there's some plaque stabilization, but not necessarily regression. Then you had evolocumab um, in the GLAGOF trial showing a massive decrease in LDL cholesterol and a dramatic decrease in plaque if you got the LDL to extremely low levels. And so the question is, where on average do you need to be to get uh, plaque regression? That's an LDL of about 89. Where do you, to get both sta uh, two standard deviations to get everyone to have plaque regression? That's be an LDL of 58. And so I was extremely happy a few weeks ago when the when the, uh, ESC looked at that data and decided that uh, this is their recommendation for treatment goals for LDL and just blowing up that top line. If a person has coronary artery disease, they should have an LDL target of 55 and agree with that completely. Now, can we do this with diet? You certainly can. There's been anecdotes out there for a while, um, doing a plant-based diet, lowering the cholesterol, seeing the plaque go away. Um, angiographically, it looks pretty impressive. Um, if you look at the reversal studies by, but by percent diameter stenosis, which was done, uh, by Dean Ornish with the Ornish diet. Uh, it is there, the, yeah, you notice that the end is very small at the bottom. So it's not the, the kind of stuff that you can use in a guideline necessarily, but, it's, uh, but the signal is very clear and it does reach statistical significance. And as Dean would say, that's the strength of the signal. Being a nuclear cardiologist, of course, I loved it when he went and, and worked with uh, our pet guru, Lance Gould at uh, University of Texas. And you're, if you stare at that for a little bit, you don't have to know all of the details of the color scale, meaning that blue is bad. Uh, this is right coronary artery, probably uh, up totally occluded. Oh, very low levels of stress perfusion with adenosine and rubidium. Three months later is what's at the bottom with no other intervention other than Dean Ornish's plant-based diet. 
And so the massive amount of the ischemia has gone away. Um, that probably could be done with, to some degree with a statin. There's good nuclear data that you can get reversal because you're, when you lower the lipids, you improve endothelial function. Um, probably the one that gets the most credit for plaque regression is caldwell Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, showing that, yeah, your nuclear scan gets better, but you can actually have complete resolution. And I, I, those of us who do, have done angiograms, you're staring at this thing, how do you fake that? Because there's no way that's real. But it really was. It was uh, 32 months later um, after a completely plant-based style. And, uh, and got to give uh, Esselstyn credit. He has a no oil, uh, no nuts approach. Not as sure I agree with the no nuts part. That's because data on weight loss and um, uh, yeah, ampule linoleic acid, which we seem to need. But uh, can you clean out a coronary with that diet? Absolutely. So that's something to reckon with. OK. so. Uh, I, my summary slides would really say that you, we are in this epidemic. It's led by our risk factors and our lifestyles. Uh, there's a massive number of things that we're seeing in the cardiovascular community that we can improve upon dramatically uh, by intervening and that the more you do it, the better off you're gonna be. Uh, there really are, if you have uh, any risk factors for heart disease, there are no safe animal products, but it's not just animal products, it's uh, the saturated fat, the sugar, the refined cardio carbohydrates that promote cardiac risk. And, you know, yes, we can keep treating them with drugs and devices, um, but um, how about changing the lifestyle? Um, people ask about the mortality, the Mediterranean diet, so I throw that in there, reminding you that uh, it's a wonderful idea, uh, but it does not consistently lower mortality or myocardial infarction. Uh, so it's probably not what we need to be doing. So Michael Pollan uh, said this years ago, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I say that if he had all the data that we have today, he'd probably change a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right, I have one more minute before I open up for questions. So let me throw in a, a little extra slide here that uh, someone actually mentioned this, that we don't get enough. Uh, this actually came for our nutrition subgroup at ACC, um, published in Journal Medi American Journal of Medicine, how many of us get nutrition in new medical school or fellowship? And the answer was 1% of our FACCs and 0% of our trainees. So it's something that we have to change. I'm taking it very personally because um, uh, even though it, it's in, this one was published three weeks ago saying it doesn't matter where you are, if you're in medicine, you're not learning anything about nutrition. And I, they agree with our findings and they globalized it. Um, and that if we really change uh, our society, we can actually improve our, our outcome for our patients. So I'm hoping that we all will uh, take this all very seriously. Uh, more uh, food as medicine uh, would be very, very helpful. And I'm going to do that last slide. I have 60 seconds left. Um, and that is the you know, making this very personal uh, because I've had too many friends my age who have had this happen. I'd actually talked to uh, John Warner right before he had his heart attack about plant-based nutrition. And he was talking about his risk in taking Lipitor, and then he famously had the heart attack at the Heart Association meeting. But it wasn't just John. Uh, he had sudden death, but he was resuscitated twice, and so he's actually doing pretty good. But for those of you who are in the intervention world, you remember your president, um, when I was ACC president, Charlie Chambers, and he passed away because he was on his lawnmower, and there was nobody to do uh, uh, resuscitation. Uh, Mark Silverman worked with me on the APIM, writing board questions that you all love. He was a brilliant guy um, and uh, died suddenly. And then our chair um, of that committee uh, uh, died in the, the dean's office. Um, the next guy, um, you probably think you don't know, but you actually do. He's the guy who set up the black barbershop, uh, impacting men's uh, uh, hypertension, Anthony Reed. He didn't get to see the American Heart Association in November of 17, uh, where his work was, uh, was lauded. Um, and David Knox, uh, just one of the biggest practices. You know, when you lose a person like that, relatively young, who's gonna see those patients? What about the families? And so um, people ask why I'm so passionate about it. It's because of my friends. And you know, I'm hoping that everyone um, really takes this into account and changes your diet completely because um, the impact that you have on your on your world and your patient's world and your family is too important to, to, uh, to uh, lose to um, some dietary or something that it doesn't taste that good anyway, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you very much.
All right, Jim, thank you. I know we're running a little behind, but maybe we can take a couple of questions here, David. Wonderful. It's it's very true. So the question is, uh, how do you uh, get people to change without uh, dictating how they're living? And that's a good question. There's a um, Harvard professor at the University of Chicago with me, Cass Sunstein, wrote a book called Nudge. And that is a whole idea. Should we be telling people to put on seatbelts? Should we be doing the trans fat thing that we did in the United States? Um, well, there are some public health issues. As long as we're sharing a healthcare system and we're sharing costs, we have a, an interconnected responsibility to change people's diets and, and uh, get them early release program from the chairs and sofas and exercise. And if we do all, do all of this stuff, we will make our society better. Uh, so what I like to tell people is that Medicare is failing, as everybody knows. 2026 is going to be broke. And that is because of the way our lifestyles are and the ability of cardiologists to save people's lives, not curing people, um, and, but they're not dead. And so uh, we can actually, I think it's all our, uh, you know, I'm glad you asked the question because it's something we all have to recognize. If we want to spend our money on healthcare and have the biggest healthcare expenditure and poor outcomes, it's probably not a good choice. We could take that money and do, you know, health, you know, medical education for high school inner city kids. We could do a lot of stuff with that money. So I think it's your patriotic duty to uh, change your diet. All right. Yes, sir. Yes. <clears throat> So the question really is uh, systems of care, uh, reimbursement, can we affect this? It turns out that uh, we are doing this. The ACC was very much a, a co-sponsor of the AMA resolution uh, for SNAP programs to be only healthy foods. Um, and I, I blew through them at the end, but there are government programs set up now. I mean, everybody thinks that Michelle Obama and her fruits and vegetables disappeared completely. Well, it's not government as much as our federal government, as much as it is local government. So one of those was uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, University of Virginia, where they're actually doing a food program and there are health, are there payers who are actually making sure that people have healthy food, giving a cut in their premium, um, because they're gonna see that profit um, as you reduce ED visits, as you know. And so uh, I think there is some momentum in this, uh, in this area, but it needs to be globalized. And so we're not happy. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.